Welcome to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic education from your friends at Fee. As you may have noticed, I am not Richard Lawrence. You're kidding. Uh, my name is Sean Malone. I'm director of media for the Foundation for Economic Education and the producer of this fine show. And I'm guest hosting today. So how are Very you guys good. doing? Fantastic. Great. We're excited Great. you're here. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, welcome to the side of the camera. The hazing begins now. Uh, I'll take it. I'll take You know, I've been on that side of the camera for long enough. You guys can, you know, mock me as much as you would like. There's some very on, specific on initiation uh, rituals between us. We'll oh. tell you about it later. Okay. Yeah. We'll do it between sessions. Segments, mm-hmm. I guess. Uh, so, th- welcome everybody. Uh, our fine panel of uh, Anna Jane Perel and Dan Sanchez, Marianne March, as everybody knows. Um, I just wanted to kick it off, just kicking it to Dan for a minute. Like, what's what's going on, on the website, man? Like, what what articles we got going on? Well, we have one particularly great article uh, called "The Podcast Bros Are Doing More to Inspire Individuals Than Politics Ever Could," and it's by Brittany Hunter. Um, and I just noticed that like all four of us are, are pretty much podcast fans. I, th- I thought we could just talk a little bit about what our po- favorite podcasts are. Yeah. I know, Anna Jane, you're like huge, huge into oh, podcasts. Yeah. Oh, big time. Um, I mean, I listen to all of the, I mean, the, you know, the grandfather of all podcasts, this American life. I feel like, um, I listen to kind of more niche ones. Like, uh, I don't even watch the Kardashians are keeping up with them. I don't keep up with them at all, but I do listen, to, dedicate two hours of my life every week to a podcast that's just two women discussing their, like, the Kardashians' lives. That's and substantial. It is so interesting to me, and I don't know why. How? Because it's more like Is that analyzing. divided up over drrives? Or oh, is no, that it's just, all, they go for two hours. These two just, women, shout just, out to Nat Nat and Kathleen. You just sit they down on about, a Saturday in two hours. Yes, oh, yeah, yeah. And it's, it, they literally, it's not even that they discuss what happened on the show, it is that they break down, like, I saw on their Instagram they did this, and then I heard they went on vacation here, and did you hear about this beef between a rapper that knows somebody? And so like, it's like all-encompassing Kardashians oh, news. amazing. <laughs> Kardashians news and commentary. It's incredible. Well, what's oh, interesting to me this. about that is that it's such a niche field that you can have really small audiences that are sustainable. Like whereas before yeah. in the era of broadcast is just like mass it's like, media. Yeah. It's like radical individual choice yeah. in the sense yeah. in entertainment. Yeah. So it's like it yeah. is very yeah, you're not subscribing to a cable package where you just hope that a, cha- a show you like is on and you hope it's an episode you think is interesting. Instead, you can go in and say I want to listen to this very specific Kardashian podcast and I just want to listen to what they talk about, you know, Tristan Thompson cheating on Chloe for 2 hours. <laughs> I don't That's even what know I want to listen to. Well, exactly. the 2 hour thing is one of the most interesting parts because yeah. never in old media would you spend two hours talking about anything, even <laughs> believe it or not, issues that are more important than the Kardashians. Nothing and is, now but, okay. we are able to sit down and go into these really deep dives on subjects. Yeah. Yeah. And I personally am a Joe Rogan fan yeah. girl and his podcast a lot of times will go on for three hours. I know it's nuts. I can't. I I mean, I I like listening to Joe Rogan. I do it once every like three months or Mm -hmm. something because of that. Like it's so in depth. Yeah, and I think that's just so counter to like the prevailing uh, narrative that you know everybody has such short attention spans that like Twitter is the Mm -hmm. definitive media because Mm -hmm. it's so short. Mm -hmm. Um, But meanwhile, Vine went out of business with Vine has the micro (laughs) things and Joe Rogan is doing great with his three-hour podcast. Yeah, he's the second most popular podcast right after Oprah. Oh, I I didn't know Oprah had a podcast, but that makes perfect perfect sense. Yes. I'm, uh, it's weird. Like I'm, I've been a, a, an Adam Carolla fan for a long time. So I listen to his podcast quite a lot and he's actually gotten longer over the years. He started doing like an hour and now he does two hours every every day, but it's split up. It's kind of an interesting model where he'll do uh, one segment, which is usually like an hour long, roughly, where they'll just kind of, you know, take calls or they'll talk about whatever. And then the second half is like a guest or whatever. So, yeah. And then I also listen to a, a, a two, like hour and a half long uh, comic book podcast from some dudes in Australia who I absolutely love. Well, but, I think there are, there are these like really long and information heavy ones. Like, um, I think there's called, it's called like hardcore history, which is like yeah. six yeah. hours Carlin. long, something right. like yeah. that. And that's like, and then, but then you've also got like, I love reply all, which is yeah. about the internet and about phenomenon on the internet. And, um, it's, they can be as short as 10 minutes depending mm-hmm. on what the subject is. And so I think that it does come back to choice and how much mm-hmm. I just think that it's, it's such, um, it's like a rich environment for yeah. not only like, I guess, um, exploring what you're interested in, but defining yourself. Sure. Yeah. And I just yeah. wonder how many people, you know, sign up for like the required history course and then never listen, like ne- never get in, actually engaged mm-hmm. in history. If anything, they get turned off by history yeah. because they're forced 
to to learn to do you mean like history studying studying history in school yes yeah yes as as opposed to this hardcore history is like a really popular Mm -hmm. podcast Mm -hmm. that so many people are just engrossed in these historical stories and i hate to be i get you know i hate to be cheesy but that's the market at work to me it's like they if you want to be listened listened to and you want to talk about something that's really awesome to you which is history then you have to push yourself to be the best in terms of entertainment yeah Um, i think i think you see a i think you see a big lesson there for educators in general, I mean, but really for everybody, but like, you know, how many teachers are there out there whose only benefit is they have a captive audience? Yeah. Right? yeah. It's They're the only trapped. thing, like yeah. so bored in yeah. every class that I had, you know, like 90% of the classes in high school and college. And yet you will spend, you know, six hours listening to Dan Dan Carlin. And here we have an almost infinite variety of entertainment choices Mm -hmm, and we mm -hmm. choose to spend it with podcasts. I've listened to many hours of Dan Carlin's history podcast and it's fascinating. I know all kinds of things about the Mongols that I never knew about. (laughs) They're the exception, by the way. I know a lot about about pigeons that I don't want to know about. Like you guys want to know some pigeon podcasts? I got a few there. One that I listen to is the Tim Ferriss podcast. Uh, And he... Um, he started with uh, the four-hour work week, and so he um, he writes a lot about entrepreneurship, but then he kind of shifted more into uh, self-improvement in general. So a lot of his um, his books are divided into like healthy, wealthy, and wise. Right. And so he talks a lot about, um, you know, so supplements that that optimize your 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 brain activity or or um, or how to get the best kind of workout or how to sleep or um, but but also like how to invest and, and how to be productive um, yeah yeah so I, one one that I actually enjoy listening to um, I'm not uh, with anything it's like hard for me to be a regular listener of anything because I'm often making things so it's very hard to do. To put something in your ear. Yeah, you yeah, need I'm your ears. Doing, most of the I'm doing time. these at the same time. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, I'm a big fan of Gary Vaynerchuk, and he has a lot of the same. He he doesn't get into the the health stuff so much, but you know he, this is a this is an entrepreneur who is like the most inspiring, uh, you know, kind of go get him kind of guy, and that sort of gets us back to Brittany's article, right? So we were talking about uh, the podcast mm-hmm. bros, and I, if you guys want to explain this a little bit, I, I know there was a New York Times article yeah, and yeah. some other what stuff. What was the criticism that we were kind of exploring with, like, or what was I guess the initial? What was the initial like statement made against these guys? Sure, there's a New York Times article uh, that coined the the term podcast bros. So so it characterized it sort of uh, as a movement. Uh, and so the the article featured um, Tim Ferriss. It featured Joe mm-hmm. Rogan and Aubrey and, Marcus. Mm-hmm, and um, and one thing that they found interesting about them is that they eschew politics. That they that they don't get into ideology. That they actively push back against uh, collectivist identity politics and focus. That it's a very individualistic focus. It's it's about what you can do to improve your own life. And the New York Times article uh, criticized it to some extent because it said that it uh, neglects structural inequalities. Like we need to that acknowledge be, more like right. oppression and, and out external forces to yeah. an individual's mm-hmm. responsibility or their yeah. own choice. Right. Um, and the author Molly Worthen poses the question of what does putting butter in your coffee, how does that make you better <laughs> equipped to right, solve the so, so talking about like bulletproof yeah. coffee yeah. or whatever. Or like words. sleeping yeah. 30 minutes at a time. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah right. I mean, there, and to be fair, there are a lot of those kinds of things where it's like sort of weird fad diets or like weird, you mm-hmm, know, like mm-hmm. hey, here, if you, if you sleep two hours now and then you wait and you sleep, <laughs> day, whatever. But honestly, I don't think that's what most of this stuff is about, right? Yeah. And I think motivational, I mean, motivational speakers or really people who are, I mean, their their capital is inspiration and it is encouraging people to be their best mm-hmm. selves. You can definitely like wade into the water of, okay, strange sleep habits or eating habits or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think that, yeah, let's yeah. not let's not throw out like the inspiration baby yeah. with the butter coffee water. <laughs> well, but, and you could, always, Delicious. you could always focus on one particular piece of advice right and and make it seem like that that's all they're Mm -hmm. talking about when it's just one part of just thinking very carefully about your choices about your own lifestyle and that in general is what the emphasis that is so refreshing in a world where so many people are preoccupied with changing the world Mm -hmm. when it when an individual can really change their own life 
much more than they can change, like fix the world economy, mm-hmm. for example. So yeah, I think yeah. that's that's a really good place to end this segment. Um, I think what we'd like to do is in, in the next segment, get into this a little bit more, talk about what, what it means to change the world and, and how people actually do that kind of stuff. So just bear with us just one moment. We'll take a short break and be right back. Hey everyone, my name is Tyler Brandt and I'm a part of the content department here at Feet. Did you know on top of FeeCast, we also offer over 100 eBooks online We have books by great authors such as Ayn Rand, F.A. Hayek, Ludwig von Mises, and much more. Also, if you're looking for something a little bit more practical, check out Fee's Essential Guide series. We got books on healthcare, self-improvement, Bitcoin. Whatever you're looking for, there's truly something to satisfy your interests. Go to fee.org slash books to learn more. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the FeeCast, everybody. Well, we were gone. We were talking about a uh, little bit more about the podcast bros and what they're doing for people. And one of the things that Ann Jane just said that I thought was pretty interesting was it's, it's as much as you may criticize it, it's still kind of the market speaking. They are, mm-hmm. they are benefiting a lot of people. Yeah, they're popular. People are listening to them. They wouldn't be referenced in an article if there wasn't a group of people out there, mm-hmm. whoever they are, that find them interesting and valuable. They, these people, their message adds value to their life. Yeah. Um, Joe Rogan is quoted as saying that he gets 30 million downloads every month. That doesn't surprise 30 me. 30 million people download and listen to his podcast. Yeah, I'm a little and, jealous. And Brittany uh, Hunter explains We're right behind it, them, right behind them. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be great. Brittany Hunter explains the appeal in her article. She's, she says, self-improvement has become so popular because it offers an alternative to the powerlessness fostered by the prevailing victimhood narrative. Uh, and, I, and I think that that um, is true, that uh, especially in a world where um, people are f- made to feel powerless by politics because the mm-hmm. message of politics is saying that like you can only get your life in order if you prevail over these enemy population groups. Your values can only be enforced by um, the people in power is also kind of the message to me mm-hmm. of all politics. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But well, right. But on both sides, right? Like yeah, you can absolutely. only, you can only succeed if you defeat the bad people. You can only win if you mm-hmm. align, are aligned mm-hmm. with the good people. Mm-hmm. Right? That, so that gets into the, the, um, article that I, I wrote with a lot of Dan's editorial help the other day. Um, actually, don't even remember what we called it. Young minds are determined or un, un, what undermined. Yeah. See, I can't even read. <laughs> uh, young minds are undermined by today's fashionable philosophies. And what, what I was trying to get at with that was um, it actually came out of this thing that we're doing at Fee um, in the way that we're doing messaging and trying to figure out how best to talk to people and how to think about talking to people. And that some of that got built off of this idea called scarf, which is um, like talking to our audience, right? Yeah. So, ta- yeah. yeah talking to our audience. Um, and mm-hmm. honestly, it's kind of helpful in general. So scarf is this, uh, this motivational model um, motivate. That's sort of the wrong way of saying it. Motivation. Mm-hmm. That sounds like, Ooh. yeah, but mm-hmm. it's, it's a model of the way that people are motivated. Um, mm-hmm. Created by this guy named David Rock, who's a um, you know a business consultant and a psychologist, and and SCARF stands for status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And the idea is that these are the things that everybody's sort of seeking to either uh, like you're either seeking to gain uh, in those things or you're seeking to avoid losing those things, right? So it's like you know all of us mm-hmm. are all the time sort of you know, in this constant battle of like trying to seek, you so know, like, improvement versus yeah. avoid pain. And like what's that. S? What's S again? S is status. So like if you think about, you know, the way that people look to get a promotion or just look for more respect among their, their peers, right? And so uh, one of the examples would be, you know, if you were a boss or if you're a manager, who's which is what David Rock usually is talking to, you, um, you know, if you recognize this, you might say, Okay, I'm now. I know that to get the best work out of people and to get them really fired up and motivated about doing whatever it is that we want them to do, I will praise them super publicly. Speaking to their status. Yeah, yeah. speaking to their status mm-hmm. and say like, you know what? I'm the boss. I have high status. I say, great job, right? Yeah. That way, their status bumps up and they feel like like doing more work. But the point that I'm making in the in the article is that a lot of our pop philosophy, a lot of the ideas that get sp- expressed in TV and film and in academia are kind of oppositional 
to a lot of these things. Yeah, especially the philosophy of the victimhood narrative that um, Brittany talked about in her article, that it opposes, as you raise in your article, it especially opposes autonomy. Because you write that, meanwhile, the notion that nameless, faceless institutions and society at large dictate everything important about people's lives is now extremely popular. The result is the belief that outcomes in your life aren't a consequence of your own decisions, but of random forces well beyond your control. And I, I like to think of it in terms of the, uh, the serenity prayer. <laughs> it's like it's like give me this the um what is it give uh, me the strength to yeah. change the things or give me the courage to change the things right. i can give me the strength to accept the things i can't change and give the me the wisdom to know the difference yeah right and and there there's also a notion of like the the locus of control where you if if you focus on things that you're uh, that are outside of your control you're going to be constantly feel frustrated and powerless mm-hmm. whereas if you focus on the things that you can actually control mm-hmm. like your own life then and you actually um, start to um, feel empowered. I think we all know those people that do blame others for any sort of, I mean, mm-hmm. it can be really small. Um, I mean, I think that we all encounter people in our daily lives that do blame yeah. kind of the outside world for what they're experiencing, any negativity. And I think that, so what you're saying is that one of the pop philosophies that we're talking about here is kind of acknowledging or I guess over acknowledging systematic oppression yeah. As mm-hmm. as an antagonistic attack on the uh, the importance of autonomy. Yeah, and and look, I, and I'm not trying to say in the article or anywhere else that there aren't those things, right? right like right, that yeah. that that stuff all exists. Mm-hmm, I mean, to mm-hmm. to one degree or another, depending on who you are, or where you are, or or what we're talking about. But there, that shouldn't be the defining factor for your life because if and it your success, is. Yeah you're going to feel really disempowered all the time, right? You're, yeah. you're never going to feel like somebody who can get ahead. And that's, that's kind of where I was going with some of these other things. Too. Well, I, was, I just kind of, I really like the way that you just framed that. It's not that um, to, to blame systematic, systematic downfalls or systematic, I guess, problems um, for your failure is not necessarily that somebody's wrong in doing that. It's that doing that is going to make you suffer as an individual. Yeah, yeah. And I, th- and I think that, so part of the, the point of writing that for me was, was um, I was thinking about Scarf, but I was also, um, for whatever reason at the moment, I was sort of inundated with stuff about uh, teen depression and suicide. And you're looking at all of these these things where you see evidence suggesting anyway that there are a lot of negative feelings out there among young people. And then I spent a lot of my time looking at the ideas that are presented to people, mostly through film and television, but I mean, that's what we care about here at Fee. It's Whatever, like, how do right? we communicate ideas <laughs> right, right. to young people, especially? Right. Yeah. So I, I, I look at something like status and I see a world where, you know, people, there are a lot of people who really reject even the idea that status should be a thing or that, you know, hierarchies mm-hmm, are mm-hmm. always bad. And mm-hmm, you hear a mm-hmm. lot of those kinds of things. Or that you um, are bad for striving for status. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, I mean, that you're, you're bad. And, 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 it's, and it's weird, too, because there's this level of, you know, we say... Oh, these people in power, or privilege, or whatever—they're they're bad people. Uh, but instead of saying, "Well, I'd like everybody to be raised up to a point where they all feel super empowered," a lot of times we go, "Let's knock the the people at the top down." Right. Yes. And so, when you think about that across the board, you know, through all of these other things, I, I feel like we're sometimes creating a world where it's sort of set up for people to feel bad about themselves. Yeah, and for those people yeah. who aren't socially there's not really a space for them socially to be proud of who they are speaking to you white men that <laughs> by trying to better themselves what else could they possibly do if yeah. who they are is offensive to people then yeah. what can what can you do besides put butter in your coffee and just try to be better than you were <laughs> yesterday yeah i, I think that's kind of true it's 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 tough i think for a lot of people but you know not white men i think everybody mm-hmm. right i mean yeah. i think it's it's difficult to find your place in the world it's difficult to feel like you are successful and competent and that you matter, you know? And if a lot of, you know, one of the things I talk about in the article, I I briefly mentioned is sort of Nathaniel Brandon's approach to self-esteem, which is, and the self-esteem movement as it exists today, which is that, you know, self-esteem is really built off of earned success, real self-esteem, right? But we've spent the last 25 years or so telling people that we can just give people trophies and hey, you're great, you know, and that's mm-hmm. the same thing. And it's not really the same thing. No. Yeah, because people, you, we can tell kids that, but 
kids know the difference between real accomplishment yeah. and um, and just a, a pat on the head. And a pat on the head is just not enough. Like they, the, there's an inner drive in the individual yeah. to actually uh, achieve, uh, because you know, evolutionarily speaking, that um, you know, we know if we're going to thrive and survive, or or not. And and just a pat on the head isn't going to put food on the table. Yeah, and that's that's where I actually think the pod, some of these like podcast bros or whatever are kind of doing a good thing because to to the extent that they're helping people get better at actually accomplishing stuff that is meaningful to them and that they want to accomplish and getting themselves into a place that's better in their careers or whatever else, they're helping people, you know, gain that self-esteem, that self-worth, you know, all the things that are sort of at odds with depression and, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. suicidal thoughts and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. So it's kind of, we just, we want to blame external factors for our, for our failures. Um, but that just creates an environment where we are all feel like failures. Yeah. Right. And yeah. instead of saying I can control the things that I do and I can control, um, my future and my destiny, which is a very cheesy thing to say, but <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's meaningful. It's just interesting to me how the pursuit of self-improvement is being aligned with vanity. And maybe there's a reason for this. There's a quote from the British publication, the spectator, um, about the, about the podcast culture and the quote is that the new narcissism the new narcissism is about being vain and virtuous at the same time <laughs> that is instagram if i've ever heard it yeah vain and virtuous yeah but for to sure me, to me the ultimate vanity <laughs> is to think that you can like fix the world economy like um uh, when you can't even clean your room. So, so I, have, <laughs> I, ha- I have this article called uh, Clean Your Room, Change the World, and it talks about how Jordan Peterson, his, his big message is, he, he keeps telling people... Also a podcast bro. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Is, uh, you know, there's all these young people who are talking about like how we need to restructure the world economy when they can't even centrally plan their own closet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, we're going to take a short break, but we will be right back after these messages. Oh, boy. You know, starting out in the, in the music business or in just any business, you have to have the carrot dangling. You have to know what your goals are. I think if anybody goes in without a goal, you're pretty much doomed. This is a family business. Our daughters son-in-law, my brother. We, we, we can't walk away from this. This is not something we walk away from. This is something we pass on. I mean, you're always going to run into the wall. It's just, can you figure out how to go under it, around it, uh, over it? That makes for a longevity of a, of a business. You can't give up. You just don't let yourself give up. Watch Mama Goldtone and more documentaries about women in business in our How We Thrive series at fee.org slash shows. Welcome back once again to the FeeCast. Uh, just before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the, the sort of Jordan Peterson, the, the anthemic Jordan Peterson refrain of if you can't clean your room, you can't change the world. Um, but I want to know if that's sort of true. I mean, there's a lot of people who, um, you know, have done really big things uh, in the world who have not necessarily had the most clean or pristine <laughs> personal lives. Um, you know, I mean, s- some people that we're fans of, even a lot of the time, um, spent most of their effort on the big picture stuff and did have some successes there. Um so I don't know. I just want to take... Who you, yeah, who are you talking about when you say that? Well, I mean, Rand is a pretty good example. You want to talk about <laughs> yeah. Ayn Rand. Yeah. Ayn is, uh, is a pretty messy personal life, pretty yeah. messy, um, you know, as an individual. Maybe but did she not have really the cleanest room yeah. possible. But she did change the world. Yeah, uh, I mean. But yeah, she made some some really big impacts on people. But I mean, I think you see this a lot. Uh, Paul, Paul Johnson, the, the historian, has a great, uh, great article from many, many years ago called The Heartless Lovers of Humankind. Uh, where he talks, he talks about Rand. Um, he also talks about Karl Marx. It's very interesting. Karl Marx was, I mean, a, 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 ideological uh, problems aside, Marx himself was a terrible, terrible guy. Like he, mm-hmm. 
he was awful to everyone. He got his his uh, he he lived off of his his father's money, um, you know, yeah. basically indefinitely. And then when that sort of got cut off, he started living off of Engel's money. <laughs> Uh, he and then a, he he had a kid. Yeah, he had an Ill- illegitimate son that he rejected. He had an illegitimate son uh, with I think one of the maids uh, mm-hmm. that, that cleaned his house, and then tried to pass off that son onto Angles. Like really, really bad, <laughs> bad stuff. But yet Marx uh, made a powerful impact on mm-hmm. uh, the world mm-hmm. of ideas. Right. So yeah. I, I don't know. I'd just like to open it up to to that conversation a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we don't know if it was. A positive impact for any any given sure like we have strong opinions but about big Marx and, yeah yeah mm-hmm. in, in general but and and so the and then there's the world of of just ideas uh in terms of just like convincing people of your ideas and then there's like the, the market test too and it would be interesting to to ask like okay are there great entrepreneurs who do amazing things with their businesses but would have messy rooms. Well, sure. Oh, Steve Jobs uh, didn't yeah. like. Uh, yeah, Jobs. I was going to say Jobs. Stick his feet example. in the toilet when he was stressed or something. <laughs> Jobs, or like, yeah. I Jobs was a, was a lunatic yeah. in like yeah. so many ways. And also, I just read a heartbreaking article uh, a few like a few days ago, maybe a week ago, about Lisa, his daughter, who he never acknowledged as mm-hmm. his daughter on like his deathbed. He was like, "You're not my daughter. Go away." And it was just. You know, like there's just like some, Drake uh, and his daughter. <laughs> anyway, I will say that great artist. Uh, yeah. I will say that uh, you know, there's the biography by um, Walter Isaacson that yeah. is pretty harsh on Steve Jobs, and I read one yeah. uh, called "Becoming Steve Jobs" that uh, talked about his his growth. That he mm-hmm. he actually there was a growth arc that wasn't really captured in the Isaacson bio. Uh, and I, that's nice. I mean, that's good. Yeah. I, I, that's, I was going to say that's, that's nice. nice. That's nice. <laughs> no, I, I don't want to be dismissive of, dismissive of that. But I think to the point, um, you know, you can be some of these people. But also, I think it's worth keeping in mind that these are incredible outliers, right? Yes. Like yeah. Jobs is not a person that I think anybody should legitimately aspire to. Right. Not necessarily because you don't want to be like Steve Jobs, but because you can't be like Steve Jobs. Like yeah. there's mm-hmm. just not anybody yeah. who's going to be that guy. But the reality is Steve Jobs was just a guy. I mean, we're all just people and right. we can't escape that fact. And so I think we should just engage in a little bit of maybe managing our expectations <laughs> yeah. and refraining from engaging in hero worship because yeah. we all we all have, you know, skeletons in the closet. There's all we all have things. Speak for well, yourself. Well, it's that external. It's really it's, it, it is the it's the misdirection of the external um Again, to me, it's like saying, yes. yeah, that person has achieved this amazing goal instead of mm-hmm. saying, I'm going to achieve this amazing goal or I have. Exactly. Um, it, Hi- it is, hero it, worship is denying the hero within you. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, mm-hmm. one thing I will say as maybe, you know, just to shift back uh, onto the, the sort of scarf topic and the, the topic of, of ideas and society and stuff. Um, I would say that everybody that we're talking about, Rand or Jobs or Marx or really almost anybody, Drake, you, you no. can, Drake <laughs> well, Drake probably too. I mean, um, probably, Drake and I didn't know them personally. I didn't know any of these people personally, but I would, I would imagine that very few of them. Well, I know for a fact Rand didn't feel this way because she's written about it a ton, but did not feel like they were beholden to the rest of the world. They were waiting for other people to make their mark. Right. They were empowered as individuals. Mm-hmm. They went after it on their own. It's definitely true of Drake. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, sure in his lyrics, like I'm yeah, sure that's, it's that's true of Drake. Right? <laughs> anyway, uh, no, I think that's a perfectly good. Yeah. I, I think if you look at the most mm-hmm. successful people, um, you, you'll find that to be a pretty common trait, right? Mm-hmm, like this mm-hmm. this sense of self that. It, that extends beyond that I did this yeah not but, you gave this to me but also this this sort of chip that says like okay societal barriers whatever I don't care yeah I'm I'm, I'm going through this yeah right and I'm gonna do it we were talking in the in the um pre-production meeting about Harvey Milk a little bit who was a um for, for those who don't know was a um politician in San Francisco it was one of the first openly gay politicians mm-hmm. and and Harvey Milk was a a great example of that. Somebody who faced tremendous odds, um, you know, this is in the 60s and 70s, and uh, and yet uh, did not let that stop him for a second, right? Just yeah. mm-hmm. bulldozed his way through a lot of those things. Yeah. But I, I also, what distinguishes the podcast bros for me is that they are heroes who tell people to be, be heroes. heroes themselves. Whereas there are some kinds of demagogues 
who um, basically make people feel that their only value is through them. Uh, and I think that's the difference between like a true self-improvement, yeah. you know, a guru, so to speak, and, and a political demagogue. What do you mean through them? Like that, that the only way like uh, that you can make an impact on the world is if you vote for me. Ah. Mm. Sure. Or, I mean, you know, talking about you, you, what I see in film and television a lot is, is a lot of these... You get this in kids' movies a lot, where where you get this like everybody's the same, nobody's any better than anybody else kind of stuff, and then you get the occasional movie like The Incredibles or whatever, where it's like, no, wait, our our powers make us special, and we should we should use them. We should be doing stuff with this. We should actually mm-hmm. be changing the world with the skills that we have and the talents that we have, instead of being sort of pushed into this blob of you know, everybody is exactly the same kind of mm-hmm. egalitarianism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't even know if it's legitimately egal- egalitarianism, you know? I, it, the, the stuff like that just always feels a little sad to mm-hmm. me. Yeah, and, um, and, and I think there's, like, a true core within us that responds to the messages of Incredibles. Like, so that's why Incredibles is such a, a big hit, and yeah. whereas, whereas a lot of these, like, educational programming that have these sort of, like, watered-down egalitarian message that, you know, if that's the only thing on, then people, kids will watch it, but it's not like they go crazy about it. I think it's important to kind of thread the needle on this, though, because mm-hmm. individualism is great, and I definitely support people doing and trying to improve themselves, but... We do get a lot of benefit out of our communities. Of course. Support and love and especially for people who transition from communities where they aren't accepted for their immutable characteristics, the Mm -hmm. things they can't change, and into a community where where they are accepted and loved for those things. That is powerful. Yeah. And I think we sometimes unnecessarily pit, you're right, I think we unnecessarily pit individual responsibility and and kind of autonomy against systematic or um, a sort of external, um, what am I saying, stimuli, um, that you can't be in individually responsible and enjoy the benefits of identity communities. Yeah, or mm-hmm. on the flip side that you can't be individually responsible and still see the inequities on a systemic yes. level yeah. and mm-hmm. say, "Hey, I want to fight these too." I think I think that's I think you're right. I don't think that's mutually exclusive at all. Mm-hmm. I think the, the area where I get afraid of some of that stuff is when you turn identity into a divisive force. We were mm-hmm. talking about mm-hmm. this yes. Earlier, this idea, you know, when we were talking about scarf, talking about relatedness is one of the values, the, the motivations that people have. We all want to feel connected to each other. It's the R in scarf. It's the yeah. R in scarf. <laughs> or scraf. Scraf, yeah, but, as I was calling it earlier. Yeah, scraf. Um, but, but, uh, but there's, there's different thing. ways of feeling related. And yeah. one way that, again, the demagogues make people feel related is in uh, mutual antagonism yes. for an outgroup. Yeah. And um, and that's what scares yeah. me. Yeah. That that stuff scares me. Anything where somebody is saying uh, we're related because we're part of this tribe, but everybody over there, yeah. you are so unrelated that we can't even talk to you. If I catch one of you talking to them, I'm going to excommunicate you from this group. If I yeah. catch you, you know, and even thinking or saying mm-hmm, anything mm-hmm. that might signal mm-hmm. that you're open. And the to only this way other. that we can advance as a group is at the expense of that other group. Right. That right. what's keeping us from advancing is the fact mm-hmm. that, that their, their activity is holding us back s- some way. And mm-hmm. war is the only way that we can, because yeah. uh, ultimately this identity politics is sort of like uh, low key war. It's just that like we, we, <laughs> we can only advance <laughs> yeah. uh, by, you know, taking uh goodies from uh, other groups yeah or by exploiting individuals yeah 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 and that's the stuff that i think I, that i think worries me and it plays back into this idea of like if, if you look around mm-hmm. and you want to look at what ideas are going to make some people uh feel more empowered feel happier feel more uh you know feel more self-esteem uh versus the ideas that are going to make people feel detached isolated uh antagonistic or combative with their fellow human being um it matters to me a lot that we're kind of trying to create a society where one of those sets of ideas is the prominent one and the other one is kind of left to the dustbin of history Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, on that super happy note, yeah. I think it's actually time to end. But uh, thank you, guys. This has been a wonderful discussion. I was happy to be a guest this week. 
And we I loved having you. Hopefully, do it again. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm speaking for myself. I'm yeah, you're like, oh, you. maybe, maybe not everybody. You've been great. <laughs> but uh, we'll be back here uh, next week. Uh, you'll catch us every single week on Fridays. So mm-hmm. thank you and enjoy your weekend. Mm-hmm.